So we're jumping in with another scene from Reacher, and this one we're starting with a big wide shot of this car park at a motel. A couple of interesting things to think about with this. If you had to go and shoot this scene, what would be the things that you would want to be able to do? What would the things you would need to be able to do in order to actually get the shots and see stuff? So to begin with, on a technical level, you're going to need enough light to expose your frame. Assuming you've got a high sensitivity camera, then you're still going to need to cover a large area with some kind of light in order to be able to actually see anything. So immediately we can call out all of the little sources that are around and you can probably see them perfectly well in shot yourself. But we've got all of those um, little kicks of light coming from the porches of the little rooms. There's another one over here. And then the whole area has some kind of general push of level. So the car park is lit up and it's definitely not lit up by those sources that are around the edges just there. This is something which is coming a little bit more toppy. And there are a couple of tells for that. For a start, you can see light playing on the rooftops just here. So you know something is high up pushing down in order to actually hit the tops of those roofs. And that's got to be pretty high. You've got to have a cherry picker condor to be able to get light up there and down onto those. Even our bigger stands get like a Long John Silver or Stratocrank. That's not going to get you up high enough to be able to do this and get it far away enough to have the light come in at that angle. It just it just won't work. You could maybe do it for some of the closer shots it was he later on, but for this you're going with something much, much bigger. And then we have enough light coming down on top to see the whole top of this little truck in the foreground. It's important we see that because that is what will become the focus of the whole sequence. So we need to see that. Now there are a couple of interesting things to point out there. We can actually see light hitting these guys on the tops of their heads around there and on their shoulders. So it's something high up pushing down. And we can see that uh, the side of the truck on this side is a little bit in shadow as well. And this door's in shadow, so we know it's not coming from can't be coming from this direction, can't be coming really from this direction either. So it's sort of got to be coming from somewhere up here or up here. And my bet is coming from this sort of way because of the stuff we see. So that means some kind of push coming in from this direction here and just illuminating the whole of the car park. I'm going to avoid the scenes with the female police officer. There's something going on here, got a push of light from this side, she gets a push of light from that side on her face. This is all sort of warm tones. Uh, that's coming from the uh, car headlights along here. And you can see her face just kind of moving into the light, catching a little bit of light in there. Don't want to talk about it too much, but you can sort of see what's going on. There's light coming from this side, there's light coming from this side. This side is a little bit more controlled and zoned in, so you can just see her face. Um, and it's cooler as well. So Reach comes out of the doorway just here. We've got we've got a couple of interesting things. This is a, a moving shot and it plays out so you see him coming out and you're moving back a little bit. Got all of the practical down lighters and in the background there and something is creating this push of light along the back. I can't remember if that was a car or what. And then we've got stuff just over here which would drive me nuts but you see like a kettle in the background just here and this whole room seems really brightly lit up so yeah, I just find it a bit distracting. It's also quite clean light back there. In this doorway that he's just come out of, and this area just here, it feels a little bit green. It doesn't feel like nice light. It's got a slightly, I don't know, fight clubby David Finchery quality about it. But then on this side, everything's clean and bright and crisp looking. So it's just a bit of a difference of vibe. The downlighters. You've got light kicking across the walls, and one would assume there's another downlighter up here as well. And that all makes sense with the shadows, and he just kind of plays how he plays. He's getting top lit. It's not particularly beautiful, but it does work, and the scene runs. Following him around, we see these lights that we called out in the beginning, just giving us enough that we can see everything going on. But obviously the fronts of the buildings are lit from something completely different because the color temperature of that light is really warm and it's playing across all of the brickwork there. But then everything else is lit with something so you can see all of the frontages of those buildings clearly. On top of that, we have another light source kicking into all of this greenery just here, picking it out. And then even in the deep background, there are a couple of things just playing so you can see 
frames within frames, things going back, just making it all play out in an interesting fashion. Jumping to close on Jack as he's moving forwards. So he's catching lots of light onto his head from something that's above, as yet undetermined that light is lighting the whole area. But we've still got these pops giving shape to the background, but there's definitely something, and we can see a little hint of it just here, because in the car, in the back just there, you've got this big hot spot, and it's on the back of the back windscreen. So that's angled towards us. So the light has got to be up here, pretty high somewhere, booking down, lighting all of that, getting the whole area lit is probably a little bit further over. But yeah, that's giving shape and definition to everything, including these cars in the background. If they were just lit from the front by all these porch lights, it wouldn't play anywhere near like that. On the side of Jack's face, he is getting a lot of fill. So this is not a nighttime kind of level of fill. It's definitely a big, big, big soft source just pushing in to create that. As this is a close shot, that could be something relatively um, close to camera and a little bit smaller. Uh, but if you were trying to cover more of a, a large area with that, then you'd have to take it further back. And with these little pushes of light, it's just that extra bit to help you see his expression and to get a little bit of a sense of, well, you know, there's an ear, there's his hair, there's his face. It's not just his complete silhouette when you're looking at that shot then. Interesting, when we move from this to kind of the more frontal version of looking at him, the left-hand side of his face does feel quite a lot more illuminated than it did in the previous shot. And now it feels like whatever light is going on here is about here and is pushing down across all of them. So it's catching Jack on the back of his head. You can see his shadow on the floor this way. These guys are shadowing that way. So that implies that source is kind of in between them, if you like. It's pushing more towards us where Jack is. And from their point of view, it's pushing a little bit out to the side. So it's got to be in between where he is and where they are in order to create that discrepancy of where the shadows are going. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, in my head it does, but I'll try and draw it. So imagine that we have Jack just here. We've got our dude just there. And then the light source is just here. Well then, from Jack's point of view, his shadows are going to be going off in that direction. And from this guy's point of view, his shadow is going off in that direction. So you can see as we move that light forwards, then his shadows are going off in this direction. His shadows are going off in this direction. So it starts to spread. And if you brought that light in between them and it's, it's kicking in both directions, it's not uh, an omnidirectional source. It is a um, more diffuse source that's going in several directions at once. Then he's going to be kicking in that way. He's going to be kicking in that way. So depending on where that light is, you'll see the shadows play differently. So from all of that, it's kind of telling me uh, that the light source is in between where those two are. Interesting that it's probably also playing on the trees in the back just here. And we still get some stuff going on. We can still see all of the light that we talked about in that frame when he's coming out of the door just there. That all seems to play the same. They don't seem to tweak it that much. We still have a similar look to what we had a moment ago. On this side, we have some warm tones and some sort of other little pops of light going on. These guys, again, they are telling us some things about what the shadowing is doing just here. So we have the light coming in on their faces from this direction. Shadows are consistent going that way. And we have enough on their faces that we can definitely see a little bit of shape, a little bit of what's going on. They're not completely in the shadows and they've, they've been at pains to make sure that these people aren't framed against anything too dark. So there are things going on. We have light on trees, we have light on grass. It all helps to, as a whole frame, read where people are, how many of them there are, what their, what their intention is, how they're sitting, what their body language is. All of that plays better if you can quickly look at something and see. Now it is a dark scene, but it's dark with purpose. There are layers going on. There's things that you can kind of latch onto and helps to draw your eye. Even this area of tree that we marked just here, even that helps to draw your eye in a little bit to where Jack is. 
Now, personally, I think they've done a pretty good job just here of creating a little frame around where Jack came from and keeping these guys off to the side. And between this and the first wide shot and the close-up of Jack, you've really got a sense of where everyone's positioned. That's very important when you're going into a fight scene. There's a good idea of the geography of the whole scene. So you've got a sense of where everyone is. You have an idea of where our female police officer is. So you know that she's actually higher up. She's looking down on them and she's off to that side. So if anything did go sideways, she's probably not going to be able to get there in time. You've got a good idea of where all of the protagonists and antagonists are positioned and that's important. There she is. See her eye line looking and you can see this kind of fencing. It all marries up with what we're seeing in the other shots. And we will assume then that this is her perspective. This is what she's seeing and that's why it's implied that she's got that higher angle view. Jack has moved over. We can see their shadows playing out in this direction now. So we'll kick out that way, which has reinforced everything we said about this light source. And what I find uh, myself looking at is actually the cars in the background just here, because the shadows for those cars aren't super long. And if the shadows of the cars aren't super long, it probably means that the light source is somewhere just above them. So it's got to be in this zone just here, I think, pushing over this way. So let's trace it, I think, just there. Spot the light. Maybe a little bit higher up, but that's the direction that I would see it traveling towards them from. All of the legwork they did earlier on establishing all of these sources pays off now because we have a good idea of where front door is, where they were positioned. They've moved over to ambush him. He's walked across the whole car park from that direction, and now he's just here. So it's a very nicely plotted out scene from that perspective. Everything motivated from this source that we're seeing off camera here. Now, we still have a lot of push coming from the back, and no one is completely devoid of that, although Jack has stepped so far that he is now quite in shadow compared to everyone else. Just seeing those catches on his face down this side, and that is consistent on these guys as well. So the way this looks is a pretty hard light source up here. And when I talk about things like fall off, this is a good example of where you're gonna actually see fall off within a frame. So if we're looking on this side of the frame, we're gonna see that the light is much, much brighter than it is on this side just here. And that's because of the light source being just there is brightest closest to the source and then as you fall off inverse square law kicks in and the light gradually is going to be playing less and less and less on the things that it hits because it's spreading further and that is something which as a cinematographer i would often try and avoid if i was trying to replicate sunlight say for example because the sun is so far away sunlight should not have any discernible fall off because the distances that we're dealing with on Earth just won't factor in that. But where it's an incandescent source, something like this, then absolutely you can have fall off. To some extent, we still try and avoid massive fall off because in scenes, if a character is getting really close to a light source, um, a lamp, say, and they sit down and it's really bright on the side of their face when they sit down, that is not desirable. So that's one reason why practicals um, that are sitting in shot as set dressing are often dialed down so they are playing on camera but they're not playing on the talent and then you bring in another light to light the talent when they sit down and that allows you to have that control over the light still appearing to be there and still being motivated but not falling off and not creating those um, massive uh, swings in exposure. In this scene it actually looks really nice and it plays really well but that's an example of the fall off uh, that I so often harp on about. Nice frame, I like the grittiness of it, the fact that you can't see his eyes, the fact that it's lots of specular highlights and really deep shadows. I'd say this is some of the deepest shadow work that we've seen within the series where often in the night they aren't super down. Here, it's actually got a little bit of density to it and I kind of dig that. Now, as he steps forward, he moves into the other lighting sources that are there and you start to see more of his face. And then when you flip to the reverse, 
you see these guys are catching light and there is still all of the stuff that we talked about in the background playing just there. It helps to create a sense of the environment. So if you look at Jack's head just here, we see this highlight and I think that is probably quite high and booking down because we're not getting a whole heck of a lot in his eyes still. That's quite shadowed. So that's what's giving everything on this side of his face, creating the shadow, very, very clean look. And then on this side, we have that warm light that we were talking about with the fall off a moment ago. So you get these very different textures on his skin actually, because this one is coming in and it's bouncing through his skin and giving it that shiny quality just there. And this one is doing the same, but it's got a silvery to it and it seems to be a much more specular highlight than on that side. Interesting difference between the two and just fun to see on a face. Often we try and avoid too much of these things, certainly flat onto the forehead. Um, you often try and get it down the side because it creates a nice jawline and helps to define someone's face, but flat on those kind of speculars um, I'll often shy away from in the more beauty focused work that we tend to be doing. Now the scene plays out, clearly Jack triumphs. And I just love this shot through the doorway as he walks through. You see the door open, the chaos of all of them kind of scrabbling to get up and run away. You get this cool little kick of light coming across the door just there as it opens and closes. Frame is highlighted by all of the light coming from the outside and they leg it off and the door closes. It's a nice way to wrap up the scene at that point. I'm gonna touch on one more shot. And this one has lots of those weird flary kicks coming into the lens from all of these lights just down the street. The trees, are kind of cool. This is an instance where you can get away with doing something which is a little bit weird, um, but kind of stuff you see around towns all the time. The trees are being uplit by something, and the something they're being uplit by is rather orange, so they've got, I don't know, a slightly evil quality to them. I suppose you could say it was warm, but it kind of looks a bit off seeing the light on the downside of the branches and all of the leaves and things being uplit by orange gives it a slightly unnatural vibe. Now easy enough to do, just uh, positioning some uplighters, shooting them up behind the trees and that way we get to see within this scene everything going on and we're not just looking at effectively a bunch of weird highlights and then a car disappearing for moments behind tree trunks. So if you had this scene without the uplighters, it really wouldn't have as much interest and you wouldn't be able to tell so much about what is going on. It's that same thing of trying to make your scenes read very quickly. So here, it's a very leafy suburban sort of area. We've got all of these uh, trees. It's quite a nice road in that respect, tree-lined and everything. But at night, you lose all of that. So you've got to make it read on camera. As we flip through, we see Car headlights kick in and light everything up and we get lots of atmosphere, plays across the whole scene, you know, getting getting this grass lit, catching the trees even more as you're going through. We've got this weird red and blue circular highlight which the uh, lens flare seems to be characterized by. We've seen it a few times already. And as that scene plays, the car gets closer and closer. This is the interesting bit, as the car goes round, we lose it, and then it pulls over the top of the camera. So you can't really see too well just here, but all of this is the underside of the car. And then these people get out of the car. You see the whole bottom of the car kind of move and lift as they step out. I am inclined to say that as this is one continuous shot from those headlights coming in all the way around, we lose it, and then it pulls over the top of the camera. I'm gonna say that this car is probably CG. So in the first part, it's real, and it's driving along towards camera. But then by the time we get to the point where it passes over the top of the camera, think about the logistics of that. You wanna do that shot, even if you're doing it with a little Sony camera or something, or a little Blackmagic pocket camera, it's still gonna be difficult to get everything you need and make it work and see the underside of the car at all because you've got to light it then and all the rest of it. I'd be inclined to say, do the bottom of the car on CG. It's a really simple CG shot, a couple of wheels passing in front of the lens going over the top. And then you have a little platform on a dolly or something that you slide in and your actors step off that and they're there and they're walking out the scene. It looks like they've walked out the car. If you had to actually drive over the top of the camera, yeah, you could do it. 
but if they are using a bigger cinema camera, so maybe they're on even a built um, ARRI uh, Mini, is going to be a formidable size, certainly to get underneath the car. So you've either got to have it really flat on the ground, have a really high clearance on the car, or you've got to dig it into the ground, kind of BBC nature documentary style, or you've got to be using a smaller camera to get the low profile, and then your talent have got to, or stunt drivers have got to drive over just right and not run over the camera, and you've got to light it. It just seems to me that it would be more practical to do it with a CG car and then just have the people step over and into shot. So that would be my odd call for a bit of CG within one of the episodes. Could you do it with a um, real camera and a real car? Absolutely. But I don't know. I just feel like this one's CG. Be interested to know if you know if this is, and if you do, drop it in the comments below. And if you've got any other references for this behind the scenes, um, any shots of the kind of lighting or the cameras they're using, just drop it in the comments below because I'm going off what I'm seeing in the frames, but that isn't always giving you the whole picture. Sometimes things will be removed digitally, um, so there might be a light in shot on a cherry picker, but maybe they remove it digitally in post because um, they couldn't get a cherry picker that was high enough. Um, it would be really expensive, so they put the light here and then thought we'll just do a paint out because it's a static shot. All of that kind of stuff you can't tell without the behind the scenes shots. It's really interesting if you can see them to call that. This shot then plays out. Um, we've got the guys standing there, up lighters on the house just here. We've got that um, kind of Narnia style uh, lamppost going on. I don't know what it's doing in America. And then a little light at the top of the house signifying everyone is asleep up in their bedrooms or just reading a book or something. And then these characters are gonna come in and do some something not too good. Trees in the background are lit up and then the carnage ensues. So yeah, if you have any questions, drop them below. If you wanna see anything in particular, drop it down below. I am slowly working my way through Reacher at the moment. So at some point I might get onto some of the later episodes and it might be along these lines where I'm looking at uh, some more night scenes or day scenes, or I might look back at the whole thing as a bit of a retrospective in terms of what the overall look over the episodes was, how they approach night scenes, how they approach day scenes, how they were approaching their characters and lighting faces and that kind of stuff. But that's all to come. If you've enjoyed it, leave a like and comment and I will see you next time.